Okay, so today we will talk about uh, cardiomyopathies. I think that the biggest problem uh, with regards to this topic is to understand what the cardiomyopathy is, what does it mean, what's the definition, and what's the classification. And if you if you will understand this, I think you are safe because uh, if you understand the definition, the meaning itself, uh, then the rest will be just the memorizing of a few sentences about each uh, type of the cardiomyopathy. So uh, on the beginning, we will focus on the definition and the classification of cardiomyopathies, and then we will just briefly discuss the most common cardiomyopathies. So what is cardiomyopathy? What does it mean? Uh, we will start in history. We will go back in time uh, to 1980 uh, when WHO defined cardiomyopathy as a heart muscle disease of unknown cause. So a few decades ago it was considered uh, idiopathic disease of the myocardium, which is definitely not true in these days. And in 1995, WHO uh, joined forces with the International Society and Federation of Cardiology, and they defined uh, cardiomyopathy as a disease of the myocardium associated with cardiac dysfunction. But if you think about this, about about this sentence, about the definition, disease of the heart muscle associated with heart dysfunction. So it can be basically anything. Basically anything can be a cardiomyopathy. Because if something, some disease affects the heart muscle and leads to the heart dysfunction, it can be considered a cardiomyopathy based on this definition. So basically anything can be cardiomyopathy. If you have a patient with uh, ischemic heart disease, with, a with atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries and subsequent ischemic heart disease with heart hypertrophy and dilatation and progressive heart failure, it could be considered cardiomyopathy. So should we call ischemic heart disease a cardiomyopathy? Or if you have a patient with a hypertension, the hypertension means that there is an increased afterload and the heart needs to pump against the uh, increased uh, pressure, which leads to the hypertrophy and subsequent dilatation and chronic heart failure. Again, the hyper hypertension could be considered as a cardiomyopathy or the disease of the heart valve. For example, if the patient has a severe aortic stenosis, uh, the result is the same. The heart needs to pump against uh, increased pressure and it leads to the hypertrophy and dilatation of the heart, of the heart ventricles and subsequent uh, progressive heart, heart failure. So basically anything could be uh, called a cardiomyopathy. And maybe yes, maybe it's true, because there are official terms such as ischemic cardiomyopathy in patients with ischemic heart disease and heart dysfunction, hypertensive cardiomyopathy in patients with uh, arterial hypertension and uh, progressive heart failure, valvular cardiomyopathy in patients with uh, disease of the valves. So basically anything could be called cardiomyopathy. However, this, the approach, the uh, pragmatic approach to this definition is, uh, is not the same in each hospitals, each, each region, all the regions and all the continents. Uh, the practical approach uh, to the cardiomyopathy and to the definition of cardiomyopathy varies according to the locality. So uh, what I will explain is our approach, but keep in mind that uh, this is the approach or the understanding of the, the definition of cardiomyopathy is not uniform and maybe you will encounter different approaches. So I will exp explain our, our approach, but as I said, it is not uniform. So how do we understand it in clinical practice? We usually understand cardiomyopathy as a structural or fun and functional disease of the myocardium, so it's the same, uh, which is not caused by ischemic heart disease or abnormal preload or afterload, meaning valvular, valvular disease or hypertension. So basically, uh, the definition of cardiomyopathy, as we understand it, is uh, some sort of disease of the heart muscle leading to the heart dysfunction after the exclusion of ischemic heart disease or hypertensive disease or valvular disease. So after we exclude all those three uh, 
common common causes and there is a some sort of myocardial disease with a heart dysfunction we can call it cardiomyopathy so our definition is more narrow compared to the compared to the official definition but as i said many many hospitals many departments uh, uh, include also ischemic heart disease uh, into cardiomyopathies if there is a, a progressive uh, dysfunction of the heart the same goes for classification this is not the only classification you will you will encounter several classifications and this is the european one so this is the classification according to european society of cardiology from uh, 2008 and according to this classification, we classify cardiomyopathy as a dilated, hypertrophic, restrictive, arrhythmogenic, and unclassified. But as I said, the classifications are not uniform. For example, North American classification considers also the channelopathies to be cardiomyopathies as well. Channelopathy, channelopathies, uh, it's a group of uh, diseases uh, which are based or which are caused by uh, inborn errors, inborn mutations in channels for various uh, electrolytes in, in the heart and the result is usually some sort of arrhythmia. So these are ar congenital arrhythmogenic syndromes and the North American classification includes also those channelopathies uh, into the cardiomyopathy group. Uh, the European approach is more morphological because these channelopathies are usually functional, disease, functional diseases and the European classification is more morphologically based. But North American classification includes also channelopathies such as Brugada syndrome, Long QT syndrome and some others. So the definition and uh, and the classification is not uniform, but uh, we understand it as uh, some disorder of the heart muscle leading to cardiac dysfunction, usually after the exclusion of ischemic, valvular, and hypertensive heart disease. And we subclassify cardiomyopathies uh, as uh, dilated, hypertrophic, arrhythmogenic, restrictive, and other, others. Uh, all the cardiomyopathies can be uh, can be divided uh, to familiar or acquired, primary or secondary. Familiar means that they are, uh, there is some inborn error, inborn mutation that leads to the cardiomyopathy, which can be caused de novo or it can be inherited from the parents. Acquired means that uh, uh, there is some acquired disease uh, during, the, during the life that caused uh, cardiomyopathy. Primary, primary means that the disease is isolated uh, for the heart muscle. So it's isolated uh, myocard myocardial disease. And secondary means that the cardiomyopathy is a part of the some systemic disease, amyloidosis, for example. Okay, so this was the introduction. The last important message is that the uh, those terms such as dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, they are not specific diseases. Uh, it's just the general morphological description of the appearance of the heart. So it's, it's a common phenotype. It's a common phenotype and each type of cardiomyopathy, dilated, hypertrophic and others, uh, each, each, each phenotype of cardiomyopathy uh, can be caused by large amount of etiologies. So each cardiomyopathy has its own differential diagnosis. One disease can cause several cardiomyopathies, dilated and hypertrophic, for example, and one disease uh, and uh, several diseases can manifest as uh, one cardiomyopathy, dilated, for example. So these cardiomyopathies, again, they are not specific diseases, but it's more like. Um, general mac macroscopical morphological descriptive term and each cardiomyopathy has its own differential diagnosis. Some causes are primary, some causes are secondary, some causes are genetical, some causes are acquired. So this was the introduction and if you understand this you are safe because uh, from now on it will be just a short description of each type of the cardiomyopathy but uh, this introduction you need to understand. So if you understand, if you understood this uh, introduction, you are safe. And then we will just briefly describe each of the cardiomyopathy and uh, that's basically all.
Uh, so dilated cardiomyopathy. The definition of dilated cardiomyopathy, at least our definition, is a dilatation of the left ventricle with systolic dysfunction in absence of valvular disease, arterial hypertension, or coronary disease, which could explain the dilatation. So it's basically a uh, dilatation of the heart muscle, which can be explained by ischemic heart disease, hypertension, of some or some valvular disease. Usually the disease is, is acquired. Usually it's a consequence of myocarditis, uh, so me meaning uh, inflammation of the heart muscle, which is usually infective viral disease. So usually the patient, patient undergoes or patient uh, develops uh, viral myocarditis, which can be healed uh, at integrum, or it can progress to uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So usually it's acquired disease post-infective as a state, as a consequence of myocarditis. Uh, some causes can be genetic, genetical, primary. It can be genetic disease caused by various mutations of genes for cytoskeletal proteins, such as actin, desmine, dystrophin, and many others. So some causes are primary, but usually it's acquired disease. Uh, it can be also di diabetic complications. So diabetic patients can develop uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or it can be peripartum disease. Uh, it's good to know because uh, peripartum dilated cardiomyopathy can develop and the prognosis, prognosis is usually good. Alcoholic dilated cardiomyopathy is good to keep in mind because uh, we are not exactly sure what's the, uh, what's, the, what's the mechanism, what's the pathogenesis, but it can be, uh, it can be direct toxic effect of the alcohol on myocardium, it can be volume overload because uh, alcoholic patients drink huge amounts of the fluids, so it can be a combination of both. Uh, toxic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's good to it's good to keep in mind that uh, several chemotherapeutics are toxic to the heart, and uh, those patients can develop dilated cardiomyopathy. And it can be especially in some in some regions, it can be uh, other infections. Uh, uh, for example, some par parasite infections, such as Chagas disease, which is endemic in South America. So in some endemic endemic regions, it's good to know that even other infections, uh, except of uh, viral infections, can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. And it's good to remember Chagas disease that can develop dilated cardiomyopathy quite often. The clinical presentation. clinical presentation is usually systolic dysfunction because the heart is dilated as a balloon and um, it leads to the systolic dysfunction with a decreased ejection fraction. So basically the clinical presentation is similar to ischemic heart disease, for example. Sometimes the patients can uh, manifest arrhythmias or even sudden death, but the systolic dysfunction, progressive chronic systolic dysfunction is quite typical. Morphologically, macroscopically the heart is dilated as a balloon. Uh, definition requires um, uh, dilatation of the left ventricle, but usually all four chambers are dilated. So the heart is dilated as a balloon. Usually there is some sort of hypertrophy of the, of the ventricles, but uh, macroscopically, grossly, the ventricles can be even normal or even thinner because uh, because they are thinned by the dilatation of the heart but microscopically you will see some sort of hypertrophy sometimes there is a valve insufficiency because of the dilatation because even the fibrous annulus of the heart valves is dilated uh, microscopy is usually non-specific there is usually some sort of hypertrophy. You see that the heart, uh, the heart muscle cells, the cardiomyocytes are large with a huge amount of cytoplasm and big, uh, uh, big uh, dark nuclei. And uh, between the cardiomyocytes, there is a fibrosis. So this is fibrous tissue. But this finding is non-specific. 
uh, the heart with ischemic heart disease, heart in patients with ischemic heart disease will look uh, almost the same. So the microscopy is usually non-specific, and that's why the biopsy of the heart muscle in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy is performed only rarely because the disease is, diagnosis is usually based on the clinical and genetical grounds. So the diagnosis is usually genetical because the histology, not always, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't help you because you will see just the unspecific hypertrophy and fibrosis. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is more common than the dilated one, but in a clinical praxis you will encounter mainly di dilated cardiomyopathy because those patients with dilated heart, they developed heart failure and they will appear in hospital. But the patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they are often clinically silent. Uh, dilated card uh, sorry, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is defined by hypertrophy of the heart muscle with a thickness of the left ventricle more than 15 millimeters found on the echocardiography, which is important. Because may, maybe you remember that the normal thickness of the left ventricle at the autopsy is up to 12, 12 or 13 millimeters. So the 15 millimeters at the autopsy, it would be just mild hypertrophy. But the heart at the autopsy is constricted and uh, The heart is constricted and uh, because of the rigor mortis so the thickness of the uh, of the ventricles is uh, bigger is 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 large is bigger in uh, at, the, at the autopsy so the this criterion uh, 15 and more is uh, echocardiographic criterion is good to keep in mind because if you have a 15 or more thickness of the left ventricle on the echo it's usually hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because hypertension or ischemic heart disease usually won't create uh, such a huge hypertrophy. Etiology. Uh, dilated cardiomyopathy was, uh, mainly, uh, was mainly acquired, but uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is usually genetical. So up to 70 or 80 percent of the cases is genetical, is, is a primary. Uh, there are usually mutation of genes for sarcomeric proteins. So remember sarcomeric proteins. In dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, it was uh, cytoskeletal proteins. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's sarcomeric proteins. Myosin, tropomyosin, troponins. But it is not 100% rule. There, there are some sort of overlap. So some mutations that are typical for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be found also in dilated cardiomyopathy and in reverse. So there is some sort of overlap, but uh, generally speaking, there are some mutations that are more typical for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is usual, which are usually genes for sarcomeric proteins. And there are some that are more typical for dilated one, which are usually genes for cytoskeletal proteins. But there is some sort of overlap. Quite rarely, uh, it can be part of a congenital lysosomal storage disorders or primary mitochondrial disorders. It's good to keep in mind, especially in, in children, because in adults, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is usually genetical. But in children, uh, there is a quite a large amount of uh, primary metabolic cardiomyopathies, which, uh, which comes or which appear as a part of uh, inborn errors of the metabolism. So it's good to be good to keep in mind that the children with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can often it can be often a manifestation of some st lysosomal storage disorder, for example. Those inborn errors of metabolism can manifest also as a dilated cardiomyopathy or restrictive one, but the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is quite common. So especially in children, it's good to keep in mind that there is a quite large portion of uh, inborn errors of metabolism that can manifest as a cardiomyopathy. And in these cases, the biopsy can be quite helpful because we can see this storage, we can see those changes in, in histology. Clinical presentation is different because there is, a, there is no dilatation, there is a hypertrophy of the heart, so there is no systolic dysfunction, but rather contrarywise, there is a diastolic dysfunction. 
So there is diastolic dysfunction of the heart, and what's very important, there is a huge risk of ventricular arrhythmia and sudden death. So the patients can be completely healthy, the disease can be clinically silent, and then the patient suddenly dies because of some severe arrhythmia. Those are usually those young athletes and young footballists that, uh, that are completely healthy and then suddenly uh, fell, fell on the grass and die. A lot of them had some sort of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they developed sudden, sudden severe arrhythmia. So it's good to keep in mind that those patients can be okay, but they are in an increased risk of a severe ventricular arrhythmia. Sometimes they can present uh, with myocardial ischemia or obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract, and I will exp explain why. It's because the hypertrophy is asymmetric. Uh, usually the whole heart muscle is hypertrophic, left the both left and right ventricles, but the hypertrophy is asymmetric, and the maximum of the hypertrophy is in interventricular septum, and especially, especially the apical part, sorry, uh, especially the proximal part. In the proximal part of the interventricular septum, uh, the septum bulges to the left ventricle, and it creates obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. So in other words, there is a subvalvar stenosis of the aorta because of the bulging interventricular septum. It's quite typical for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Usually there is no dilatation of the ventricles, just the hypertrophy. So prominent asymmetric hypertrophy, it's quite typical. Microscopic depends on the etiology. If you have a patient with some storage disorder, lysosomal storage disorder, for example, you will see stored material in there. But usually, in case of primary genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is a hypertrophy, which is quite understandable. So there are cardiomyocytes that, should, that are large with a huge nuclei. There is always some sort of fibrosis. But what's, what's quite typical for primary genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is something that we call disarray. Disarray means that the heart muscle cells are not arranged in parallel fashion, as you can see here but they create something like a 3D web, some sort of mesh meshwork in which the heart muscle, heart muscle cells are intermingled in all three directions. You can see it here, for example. This is called disarray. And it's quite typical for primary genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the problem is that this array is not present diffusely. It can be found only in some regions and it's very difficult to catch them in endomyocardial biopsy. So that's why the endomyocardial biopsy is usually, usually negative. It won't help you. You will see just the, some sort of uh, uh, unspecific uh, hypertrophy and fibrosis. And again, the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is usually clinical and genetical, and the biopsy is rarely performed. But it's, it's good to perform it in pediatric cases, as I said, because sometimes there can be some inborn error of metabolism involved, and we can see it in histology. Restrictive cardiomyopathy. The definition of a restrictive cardiomyopathy is, the, is slightly different, because the definition is not morphological, it's functional. The definition is that the heart is restricted from the filling, from the stretching. Something caused, something caused the heart to be more firm, and the heart cannot fill. So the definition is functional, not morphological. The etiology, usually it's, uh, it's acquired disease and usually it's amyloidosis or some other storage disorder. It can be hemochromatosis, it can be some lysosomal storage disorder, but usually it's amyloidosis. So basically there is something, some material that stores in the myocardium and because of that the myocardium is firm and cannot dilate. And usually it's amyloidosis. That's why in this case the biopsy is uh, quite commonly performed because we can see the amyloid in histology. 
So in this case, in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, the biopsy can help because you can see the storing of the material. Uh, primary genetic uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy exists, but it's quite rare. It's not so common. Uh, the appearance of restrictive cardiomyopathy can be also caused by several peculiar diseases of the endocardium. Uh, there are some disorders of the endocardium, such as Leffler endocarditis or tropic endomyocardial fibrosis, that leads to the fibrosis of the endocardium and subsequent, uh, and subsequent fibrosis of the layer of the myocardium which leads uh, to the restriction of the myocardium. So also some fibrosing diseases of the endocardium are included in this category as well. The clinical presentation. Clinical presentation uh, can be similar to constrictive pericarditis because the heart is firm, it cannot dilate. And because of that, uh, there is a bilateral heart failure because the heart cannot fill itself. And what's quite uh, what's also quite typical is atrial fibrillation. Macroscopically, the ventricles are almost normal. Not normal, but they are almost normal. There is no dilatation. Usually, there is some sort of mild hypertrophy but the myocardium is rigid and firm because of the storage of some material. And what's quite typical uh, for this cardiomyopathy, it's a marked bilateral dilatation of the atria. So the atria are large, they are dilated, they are huge, compared to the myocardium, which is firm, a little bit hypertrophic, but not dilated. Microscopy depends on the etiology. I said that it's usual amyloidosis, so there is a picture of amyloidosis of the heart. Uh, it's, this is Congo stain. This is Congo stain uh, that stains amyloid in red color. So all those red spots, it's the amyloid. It's the amyloid in the interstitium of the myocardium. So as I said, in this case, histology will help. And last but not least, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. The old term was arrhythmogenic dysplasia of the right ventricle, then it was arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy of the right ventricle, and now we call it just arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, because uh, the right ventricle is usually affected, but uh, it is not the rule, and sometimes also the left ventricle can be affected as well. Uh, this disease is characterized by progressive replacement of the myocardium of the right ventricle, usually right ventricle, by fat and fibrous tissue. And the cause is uh, some mutation of some gene for desmosomal proteins of cardiomyocytes, placoglobin, placophylline, and many others. So there are several mutations uh, of the genes for desmosomal proteins and as a result, the cardiomyocytes cannot stay together and they will just fall apart and they are replaced by fibrosis and fatty tissue. Uh, the, fi the presence of the fibrosis is quite important because in, in previous times, uh, the definition was based only on the fatty replacement. But now we know that there always needs to be both the fat and fibrous tissue that replaces the myocardium. And as I said, the background is some mutation of some gene for desmosomal protein, such as placoglobin, placophylin, and many others. Uh, diagnosis is complicated. Uh, there, are, there, is, there are complex diagnostic criteria that needs to be fulfilled. Uh, there, is some, there needs to be a typical history, typical arrhythmias present, typical morphology of the heart, typical function test, and so on. So that each patient needs to fulfill uh, concrete complex criteria. Uh, histology used to be part of the criteria as well, but nowadays, uh, nowadays the biopsy is rarely perfor performed. It is because the right ventricle is usually very thin and replaced by fat and fibrous tissue, and, and the myocardial biopsy could be dangerous because the cardiologist could very easily perform, perforate uh, the 
heart muscle it could very he could he or she could very easily perforate the free wall of the right ventricle and create a heart tamponade so that's why the histology is rarely performed in these days and again the diagnosis is usually clinical and genetical clinical presentation can be uh, can be described in three phases. In the first phase, uh, the heart looks normally. So in the first phase, there is no morphological change and no, fi no pathological finding on ECG. But even in this phase, there is a risk of severe ventricular arrhythmia and sudden death. That, that's why we call it arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. In the next phase, the remodeling and the fibrofeather replacement of the right ventricle uh, begins and the typical ECG changes start to appear. And in this phase, ventricular arrhythmias are quite frequent. And the third phase is, um, is uh, in the third phase, there is a progressive failure of the right ventricle. And those patients are usually transplanted. From the morphologically, as I said, there is a, a replacement of the myocardium by fibrose and adipose tissue. Right ventricle is usually uh, affected, sometimes also left ventricle. In rare cases, uh, left ventricle can be predominantly affected, but usually the right ventricle is uh, predominantly affected, not the left one. And after that, there is a progressive dilatation of the left, left uh, sorry, there is a progressive dilatation of the right ventricle, sometimes even with the aneurysm formation. If you look at this picture, this is Weigert van Giesen staining, which stains uh, fibrous tissue in red color and muscle tissue in yellow or, or orange color. And this is wall of the right ventricle. And you can see that there are just a small remnants of the myocardium and the whole wall is replaced by fibrous tissue and fatty tissue. And such ventricle is very thin, it cannot work properly, and subsequently it will dilate. Okay, uh, so just for the end, this is, this is quite peculiar type of cardiomyopathy which is called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Now we are talking about the others, about the other cardiomyopathies. And maybe you should remember one or two sentences uh, about Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. What it is? It's a disease that has usually rapid onset, rapid onset manifestation, but usually it's reversible. So there is some sort of dysfunction of the left ventricle with rapid onset, but usually it's reversible and it's caused by extreme stress reaction to both internal or external physical or emotional stimulus. The probable underlying mechanism is direct toxic effect of circulating catecholamines in high levels. So basically, you've got some stress reaction that leads to the uh, increased production of catecholamines into the circulation and catecholamines in high levels are toxic to the heart. So it's basically uh, intoxication of the heart by catecholamines. And the stress reaction can be caused by internal or external stimuli, stimuli. And it can be physical or even emotional stimulus. So that's why this, this uh, cardiomyopathy is sometimes called broken heart syndrome, because even emotional stimulus can lead uh, to, this, uh, to this disease. Morphology is quite peculiar. There is a dilatation of the left ventricle, but the dilatation typically affects the apical portion of the left ventricle. This is angiography, and you see that the apical portion of the heart is dilated, and the proximal part of the ventricle is quite normal. And the shape of the heart, shape of such heart, resembles takotsubo. And takotsubo, it's Japanese word, it's Japanese word for octopus trap, uh, it, uh, takotsubo, it was uh, some sort of uh, vase that was used for catching of octopuses. And the Japanese word for this is uh, takotsubo. And the shape of the heart resembles this vase. 
So that's why we call it Takotsubo cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. So it's basically intoxication of catech by catecholamines. And this is the last cardiomyopathy that I would like to mention. Uh, it's called non-compaction cardiomyopathy or spongiform myocardium. What it is? Uh, this cardiomyopathy is characterized by prominent trabecularization of the ventricles, especially the left ventricle is affected. Uh, there are deep recesses and sinuses in the wall of the ventricles that communicate with, uh, with cavities and there is a usually uh, incomplete formation of papillary muscles. So the whole heart looks like sponge. Uh, it's probably a failure of the embryonal development of the myocardium because this appearance, this spongiform appearance is a normal physiological phase of the heart in embryonal, embryonal development. And from some reason, the heart is stopped in this phase of embryonal development and it looks like sponge. So that's why we call it a non-compaction myocardium or spongiform, spongiform myocardium. So it's a failure of embryonal development of the myocardium. And that's all. So as I said, the main problem uh, uh, with regards to this uh, to this topic is to understand what cardiomyopathy means, what is the definition, and what is the classification. And keep in mind that uh, this definition, as I mentioned, it is not uniform definition, and there are different approaches, different approaches to the classification and different approaches to the definition itself. And if you understand this, if you comprehend this, uh, you are safe because uh, after that it will be just a quick memorizing of a few sentences about each type of the cardiomyopathy. So thank you again for your attention and see you next time.